Well, greetings, friends, in the lovely name of Jesus, and welcome to another episode of the Bible verse by verse. We are discussing the uh, interview that Jesus has with Nicodemus at night. We're in John chapter 3, and we're going to begin with verse 9. Before, before we get there, let me draw your attention to our information box below. Please visit that before you leave this uh, episode and click like and share. And in the lower right-hand corner of our screen is our ministry emblem. And if you'll just hover over that, uh, then the banner will come up and you'll have the opportunity to subscribe to our channel. The Lord bless you. Now let us pray and go right to the word of God. Most gracious heavenly father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> Having said that, then we're going right to our scripture lesson today. And we're picking it up in verse 9. <clears throat> Nicodemus and Christ have been conversing. And uh, I would uh, recommend that you go back and view our previous uh, episodes beginning, well, you need to, I would recommend you begin in John chapter one and come forward. Uh, also, I might say that we have uh, about 90, maybe a little bit over 90 videos on the first part of the gospel of Matthew on the Bible verse by verse. And here we're doing the Gospel of John. <clears throat> and the way that this is beneficial is if you are studying the scripture and preparing a, a sermon or preparing a Bible lesson and you are on a particular verse, uh, especially in the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of John, and you would like to know what my thoughts were on those on that particular verse, all you have to do is go just Google, go to Google. Bishop Jerry Hayes, and then put the scripture in. And my video will come up, and uh, also any blog that I have written on the topic will come up as well. Now, this is uh, uh, information that doesn't cost you anything. We make it available to you free of charge. We do ask that you prayerfully consider uh, helping us by uh, support as the Lord would lay it on your heart. Now we're going to chapter 3 and verse 9. Nicodemus asked Jesus, can the, how can these things be? Nicodemus uh, started out asking the Lord about how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? But when Jesus re-engages him in verse 7, he raises Nicodemus' uh, focus off of the individual being born again to the entire nation being born again. And I think that this is what prompted this question from Nicodemus. How can these things be? How can the entire nation be born again? So uh, that's where we get the question here in verse 9. Now let's go to verse 10. Now, Jesus uh, is just as good to Nicodemus as he is to, as Nicodemus is to Christ. Nicodemus asked Jesus questions. Here, Jesus asked him an all-important question. Are you a master in Israel and knoweth not these things? Now, the Greek here is didaskalos, uh, and it's Strong's uh, Greek number 1320. And, uh, and you don't know these things. Uh, and uh, literally here, are you a master? I'm sorry, are you a master? And that word is didaskalos, Strong's number 1320. And, and it literally means teacher. Uh, verse one has ruler. The Greek archon, Strong's Greek number uh, 758. Now, Nicodemus should have known of the presaged natural new birth 
The prophets had foretold of it. Joel spoke of the outpouring of God's Spirit as a national promise. Joel 2.28, and we need to compare that to Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. Plus, Amos foresaw Israel's new birth and called it the tabernacle of David being rebuilt. And we need to see Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 12, and compare that to Acts chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. Ezekiel further prophesied of Israel's new birth through his vision of a valley of dry bones, which was Israel, that received new life from above. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 15, and we need to compare that to Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Now, Jeremiah foretold of a new covenant with the houses of Israel and Judah. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, and we need to compare that to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. <clears throat> Christ, the Messiah, had indeed come to establish a new spiritual Israel. He had chosen 12 apostles to replace the 12 tribes and 70 disciples to replace the 70 elders, the Sanhedrin. For further study on this point, I would recommend that you see Romans chapter 11, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16 compared to Matthew chapter 9 verses 16 through 17. Now what I've just shared in this la just in the last minute is a lot of information and if you would just avail yourself to these scriptures I'm sure that uh, you would be amazed. We go to verse 11. <clears throat> Jesus said to Nicodemus in verse 11, well, let me just turn there and read that. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. <clears throat> we speak what we do know, what we have seen, but you do not, ye do not receive our witness. <clears throat> now, number one, the plural you all hear, Jesus is not just talking to Nicodemus. Jesus has raised the bar. He is talking now to all of uh, the Jews when he says, ye do not receive our witness. Nicodemus just represented them because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was one of their teachers, one of their rulers. Now, but there's another plural pronoun he here, and it's we and our. <clears throat> now, this plural reference, <clears throat> we, is most likely a reference to the combined testimony of Christ and John the Baptist, which is referenced a few verses below. Now, another consideration is that Jesus is speaking in the plurality of plenitude, as did Yahweh in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where Yahweh said, let us make man. <clears throat> now, this latter consideration would be in keeping with the parabolic manner of Christ's teaching concerning himself and on Jesus speaking in parables concerning his relationship with the Father, you need to see John chapter 16 and verse 25. <clears throat> I would advise you to just go ahead and run over there and look at that, because it'll be a while before we actually get to that place in the Gospel of John. Now we move to verse 13. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Wow. This is, this is a verse. This is a text that has many people scratching their heads. This verse presents a few challenges. One, if no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, and that's what Jesus said, 
Well, I would ask the question, what about Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2 and Enoch in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24? And there's another challenge here. Most of the oldest manuscripts omit the last statement, which is in heaven. And three, another challenge, if this final statement is allowed, the term son of man, which indicates the humanity of Jesus, places the human Jesus in heaven and on the earth at the same moment. Now, while it would not be biblical to assert the omnipresence of the humanity of Jesus pre-glorification, it is factual to assert that that which became human, i.e. the Word, you know, John chapter 1 and verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, was or is indeed omnipresent. The Word, the divine Word, the divine expression is omnipresent. So this passage presents a challenge. Now, the following explanation by Ellicott may be helpful. I, I rather like it. Quote, There can be no other means of receiving heavenly truth. No man hath learned it and is able to teach it except the Son of Man, whoever was and is in heaven. The thought has met us before in John 1.18. To Nicodemus, it must have come as an answer to the words of Agor, which had passed into a proverb to express the vanity of human effort to know God. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? That's Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4. Now, no man had passed to heaven and returned again to earth, but there was one then speaking with him that could tell him its eternal truths. He had that knowledge, which a man could obtain only by ascending to heaven, and he came down from heaven with it. From the human point of view, he was as one who had already ascended and descended. Now, this is the evident meaning of the sentence, and the form is quite consistent with it. Now, concerning the words, which is in heaven, and I'm going to have a little bit more to say about this. These words are omitted in some manuscripts, including the Synactic and the Vatican. Now, the judgment of most modern uh, editors, not including Westcott and Hort, retains them. Now, it is an instance where it's hard to account for the insertion by a copyist. But where the omission is not unlikely, owing to their seeming difficulty. And yet, the difficulty is one which vanishes before the true idea of heaven. If heaven is thought of as a place infinitely distant beyond the clouds and the sky, or as a time in the far future where this world's life shall end, then it is indeed hard to understand what is here meant by the Son of Man which is in heaven. And a copyist may well have found in omission the easiest solution of the difficulty. But if heaven is something wholly different from this coldness of distance and space and time, if it is a state, a life in which we are, which is in us now in part, but hereafter in its fullness, then may we understand and with glad hearts hold to the vital truth that the Son of Man, 
who came down from heaven was ever in heaven, and that every son of man who is born of the water and of the spirit is made a member of Christ, a child of God, and an inheritor in the present of the kingdom of heaven, end quote, Ellicott. Now, concerning the phrase, which is in heaven, if the just mentioned explanations are uh, insufficient, there is the possibility of prolipsis. Prolipsis is a figure of speech where something is said to exist at present that is actually future or past. A statement that is how can we say, out of joint with time. Now, Jesus could be speaking proliptically of his post-resurrection existence. And the reason I say this is because Jesus employs prolipsis many times as John records it. In John chapter 17, he he, he speaks proliptically at least four times. In verse 4, verse 11, verse 12, and verse 24. And here's how he says it in verse 4. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Except when he said this, he had not yet finished it. But yet he spoke proliptically. He spoke of a future finished work as being present. And then in verse 11, he does it again. And now I am no more in the world, except he was. But these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Then in verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. When he said this, he was still with them. But he spoke of it. (coughs) (coughs) Excuse me. As being past tense. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then lastly here in this 17th chapter, there's verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. He was speaking here proliptically of the time when he would be beyond the glorification, and in heaven. Now, Christ made the above, uh, the above statements while still on the earth, before his crucifixion, resurrection, and glorification. Here we're going to end our episode for today, and I trust that uh, we have given you something to think about and uh, what you have just heard may be uh, a little bit beyond uh, the common fare of what you might hear Bible teachers teach. But after all, you are listening, watching the Bible verse by verse with Bishop Hayes, and uh, this is a production of the Apostolic Disciples of the Way. Please visit our information box below, like, share, and in the lower right-hand corner, you will see our ministry emblem. If you'll hover over that, then you can subscribe to this channel. Until we're together again, beloved, it is my prayer that you go with God and that God goes with you. Godspeed, my friends.